Hey, everybody, it is Lauren Delisa Coleman, and I am back with another kind of mini um, series of interviews for you. We are doing the Harlem International Film Festival. This is actually the first time that I've ever covered this film festival, and I'm super excited about it. It is in its 17th year, um, and we are doing this actually on the day of opening night, and then it will take place over the weekend. And I have our first filmmaker who we're interviewing, who I'm so happy to bring to you. Please welcome Magali Coleman Christopher, who is the filmmaker behind a very cool film called, and I want to make sure I get the full title right, <laughs> Aftershocks, A Tetralogy of Our Times. And so um, Magali, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm so excited to talk with you about this film. You guys will see why, because it is, um, I think, a different and much needed part of this larger COVID conversation, which I have not seen. So um, could you give us first, as we always ask, um, a brief synopsis of the film, please? Well, Aftershocks and Tetralogy of Our Times is a mosaic of stories. It's kind of in the same line as Magnolia was. You have a number of Caribbean American people dealing with the impact of the pandemic. And the story of the movie goes from April uh, April 2020 all the way till May 2021. So we take the journey through the confusion all the way to, oh, we have a vaccine and now what? So the big question of the film is, what would you say about today? What would be the story that you tell about today? And so it's full of different pieces are dark, com darkly comedic, lightly comedic, somewhat dramatic all giving you a sense of the love and the strength of the people of the Caribbean diaspora and how that ha the strength is what got them through it. And just to, to clarify, I mean, these are Caribbean people um, or people of Caribbean descent living here in the United States. Yeah, it's set um, in New York and, City, it's set in Queens, New York. Right. Queens, so it's the, so the you real, see if Queens, you guys have York. ever been there as, as both Magali and I have, you know, it's the real vibe. So um, yeah. I just thought it was... Um, so interesting because I've interviewed other filmmakers around this topic, of course, but not from this particular demographic perspective. And I think whatever we've kind of seen out in the world has um, been a more mainstream approach. And so, you know, everybody went through this. And so it's just interesting to see how different um, communities, neighborhoods, and again, demographics went through this. What compelled you to be able to tell um, this story with this particular, you know, um, I guess, community in New York City? My company is called Conshell Productions, and our focus is the voice of the Caribbean diaspora and the Caribbean artists. And I was finding that there was not enough being told about our true story. You would see commercials on television, people still saying, oh, yes, I love it. I love the vaccine. And not really seeing the real person talk about the journey. <laughs> right, right. You know, right. so it was very um, pitching the vaccine. You never heard the quiet stories. And so it was really important to me to share these pieces to inspire people to speak to their story or to own their truth. Because I, I'm of Haitian descent. I'm a first generation Haitian American. And I know for a fact that the Haitian community is very about trauma, right? And there are a lot of communities of the diaspora that about trauma, move forward, move forward, move forward. So it's in the moment of the trauma, those stories, sharing those stories helps you come to terms with your here and now. Well, it's so interesting that you say that because I know a lot of the coverage that took place during, um, kind of all the, the Tulsa narrative, I guess, was last summer. The original um, people who went through that said the same thing, right? That mm. in order to maintain um, during such kind of craziness and chaos and horror that you can't really speak about it, talk about whatever, because then you, you don't have also the amount of energy to be able to get through it. Also, what I found was very interesting listening to some of those people, maybe it was the same here, is that the adults, like the children that, who were, the people who were children then, who are adults now, said that their parents who lived through it did not speak about it because, and other things, because they weren't certain what the 
child might say out in public, which could then, you know, create some kind of problem, especially with, um, you know, racism as it was back mm. then, right, where you could be killed then. So there wasn't a lot of dis- dis- discussion and exchange internally, externally, et cetera. And it's the same thing even now you find with this and so much more. Well, I just find among the artistic community, we're willing to share, but I've spoken to people in different countries and they're still just coming to the ter- to terms of the fact that this thing happened. Right. And the narrative that's being captured is not necessarily the narrative of the underrepresented. So um, I definitely feel that Caribbean diaspora and Caribbean communities in the United States tend to keep their silence about various matters, whether it's Mm. Black Lives Matter or the impact of the Trump era or the impact of COVID. So my goal is to help all of us, not, you know, people of the Caribbean diaspora, people of the Caribbean, people of the world to say, I think I want to tell this story so that I can move on without a scar. So now did you, um, I guess in that spirit, did you have trouble finding people who were comfortable opening up? Oh, these are all narratives. Like were they just happy to open up or what? These are all fiction. These are all narrative fiction. But you didn't pull on any um, kind of, you know, real or nonfiction stories at all? Well, the the fact is I wrote some of the pieces. Juan Ramirez Jr. wrote the uh, a piece called Sheep. And so I guess you could say a lot of the perspectives were from my understanding of what I was hearing in the world okay. around me in quiet conversations as opposed to mm-hmm. on a stage mm-hmm. for people to see. And so my goal is to say, okay, it's great to have the quiet conversation, but are you able to move forward? Right? and Sometimes telling your story is the first step to moving forward. Taking the space and say, this was my experience. Somewhat similar to vagina monologues and how it empowered women who were being silenced about their journey and the Laramie Project and how that empowered people who were part of the prison system to own their story. If you create a space where you're seeing people somewhat like you sharing a perspective of the experience, it makes you feel less alone and more inclined to maybe saying, I think I want to talk about this as opposed to push it behind. That's my hope. That is my hope. And as artists are, as an artist, my goal is to inspire social change. And if I can inspire our people to hold less in and be burdened by the sadness that occurs when you hold your trauma in to release it and to truly release it and move Mm -hmm. forward, wouldn't that be, a blessing to be able to provide that as an opportunity and a resource. So while um, there's nothing but hope and joy and possibility in Aftershocks, I wanna say that yes, there is hope and joy, even as you face the the, the challenges that you're facing, you can actually lean towards hope and joy. There's no need to dwell on the negative, but at least accept the fact that it occurred and find a way to move forward with that acceptance as opposed to let's just forget this. It never mm-hmm. happened. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We'll see. As, we'll see. As is said, I guess now in the, you know, popular narrative to honor um, that mm-hmm. which has happened and, you know, yes. to be able to then move on from it. Um, let's talk a little bit about the logistics though, of making the film and how mm-hmm. um, you decided to take this route of, you know, a number of different stories and talk to me about the word tetralogy and how you, you know, just kind of, gravitated toward that? Well, it was first conceived as a series of four short plays, and I wanted to do it in a space, in a live space, but we had gotten, a um, not but, we had received grants from the City Artist Corps and Queens Council of the Arts, and the initiative required that your project had to be completed by a certain date, and during that period in time last year, you couldn't find a theater space because of COVID. It was really difficult to find a space where audiences could come in and have access to the work. And so my idea was for it to be an interactive experience and interactions were not occurring. So 
I was brainstorming and I happened to have been speaking to uh, an animator, Andre Sutherland, and I was expressing how frustrated I was feeling about the not being able to achieve my goal to inspire the Queens community to find their voice. Mm -hmm. And so we started brainstorming. I was like, wait a minute, I can just do this as a hmm, smartphone film and we can use animation. He's like, yeah. And so we just brainstormed and so i wrote the concept and i brought some amazing directors on board and juan ramirez jr was so thrilled was like yeah let's do this because prior to that I had been doing hybrid theater online presenting different events reset series all these of during the reset series 2020 was addressing police brutality in america and systemic racism so i've been doing work online and there were so many wonderful technologies coming forward in that period of time zoom theater and so on and OBS, all these different technologies that allowed for the possibility of shooting a film with a smartphone. And then, of course, during the pandemic, Netflix was the first one to come out with a project. I think it was socially distanced. And I was like, and I had uh, attended an event where the actors were saying they had set up a bunch of Apple iPhones. There were no cameramen in the space. They had to set up their lights. And I'm like, well, we're going to do that too. And so we had amazing cast members who were ready for to play and be their own makeup people, their own camera people, their own sound people, and an, am an amazing pair of directors, Pat Golden, Tisha Duncan, who were phenomenal with the actors, phenomenal with the medium of directing via Zoom. <laughs> so I so, just feel like now you're such a pro at so many, like, different like levels of media do you have a favorite and then you know as you look to the future what do you think that you might do next is your love really in you know live theater and you're going to like go back to focusing on that or now that you've tasted other things I mean you know what I mean like what what do you think is going to come from Miss Christopher next I'm wondering well actually um I'm a television I perform I'm an actor First and foremost, that's my career. So I've been performing on television for many years and I love the film and television medium. But the thing of the matter is I'm fascinated by VR and AR. And so that's a common, that's a hybrid concept for theater. So to say I'm theater focused would be to lie. I love film. I love the way that the image tells a story. To say that I don't love theater would be a lie because I love language and in theater language thrives. So one, the other, a combination of the two in hybrid forms. I see that as a producer and also as a writer, because you have to definitely write for the for the medium. Absolutely. There's theater writing, there's hybrid theater writing, and then there's film writing. And so there, the hybrid theater is a mixture of the two. So it's a, it's a beautiful time for the creator to expand the definition of what a genre is this expand the definition of what content is even within theater they don't they don't quite know what to call what we're doing with hybrid theater is it hybrid theater is it theater is a film they're shooting it they're editing it what is it no one truly knows and it's wonderful it's exciting it's empowering for the artists to be part of a burgeoning growing concept and so i'm really thrilled that we were invited to screen our film at harlem international film festival because this is truly the hybrid of the hybrids. Well, that was and, what I was going to ask you next. What was that um, process like? At what point did you decide to um, submit the film to this festival or did the festival hear about you? Like, I'm always really curious to hear how, you know, things come about. And then, of course, now, you know, you're screening the, the film there. But tell me a little bit about what that was like for you. Well, I, my, the first short that I shot was Yes, Madam. And so that was my first experience with the whole submission to film festival world. We screened at Pan African Film Festival. We screened at Martha's Vineyard Film Festival. And so I understood the world. And so when I pr produced this, I wanted to make sure that the Caribbean diaspora voice was heard. And the funny thing, the wonderful thing, is there was an article in Variety magazine where Caribbean diaspora filmmakers were expressing their desire, their frustration about the fact that the Caribbean diaspora voice was not being recognized as a unique, unique voice. So I felt that in order for this film, this project, to have its full impact, we had to reach a wider audience. Mm -hmm. And I selected film festivals where I felt that the audience would resonate with the work. 
where the work would have the impact that I had hoped for, where it would enlighten and empower, free up the voice of those who are not speaking to this experience that we had for the past two years and still are having. So then you were accepted at Harlem. Um, and um, what night are you playing, by the way, or screening? We're actually online. So we start screening May 8th and we go from May 8th to May 15th. They have a huge collection of films that they're screening online. And as a matter of fact, Conchal International Film Festival is a festival that we're also doing and it's online. And I'm really excited that our film is going to be part of Harlem International Film Festival's online platform because I have attended so many film festivals online since 2020. It's thrilling. So now the audience doesn't have to pay for an airfare and hotel to go see new works. Indie filmmakers are re reaching a wider audience because you can sit at your computer and watch films. I attended the Pan-African Film Festival last week on my computer. And I, I, of course, you don't get to meet the people that you want to meet. But the thing is, you're seeing the work. And so if you're passionate about film like I am, it's exciting. It's an exciting time. And so I was so thrilled when I heard that Harlem International Film Festival was both in person and online. So that's where we're going to be. So, so great. Watch our film. <laughs> yeah, you got a promo. <laughs> Come on. You, you, um, you know what I'm saying? You, since this is the 17th one, have you ever um, been to Harlem International Film Festival in person prior? Well, no, I've never attended it in person. And the whole thing was when it would be occurring, I'd either be involved with another project or I'd be out of town. Oh, so, okay. you know, if it were online, then I would have been able to, oh, at midnight, go watch a film, right? But now, whether you're in Italy or Ireland or Harlem, New York, you could still see the films. It doesn't matter where you are. So that's this is a really exciting time for film festivals. I mean, I attended Tribeca last year online and Sundance this year and last year online. So everybody's understanding the impact of streaming your festival online and how it broadens the, not only the demographics, but the, the reach. I mean, every, every terminology you wanna come up with, I'm, I'm hoping that this inspires people of the Caribbean diaspora and the African diaspora to say, I want to watch these films and hmm, I can submit my film to that festival next year too. As opposed to thinking it's some far off notion that doesn't belong to them because of the price of trans transporting themselves and their team to the festival. Absolutely. So, so great. So what are you going to be working on next? I can only like just imagine. <laughs> well, um, Right now, I am working on the Conchal International Film Festival, our company's film festival. We also have a new work series, which is our theater aspect. We're going to be doing readings of new works in November. Um, and we're also screening the film for community members because it's it was made for Queen's people. Right. So now that the COVID pandemic has is not as threatening as it was. We're going to be doing live in-person events and workshops to inspire people to share their story. And we will share their stories if they're willing to, you know, write their experiences so that they can feel validated. They can feel seen. They can feel that their presence meant something and that perhaps they're going to help someone else heal from the impact of this period right. in our history. Because it's, a, I mean, a massive community, right? Not just in Queens, but I mean, like I always think of Brooklyn first, right? Um, if you're talking, you know, Caribbean um, diaspora. So it's a big, big voice. So I'm glad that you've been able to, you know, just kind of bring that voice to light. How can Thank we you. keep up with what you're going to be doing next? You have a site, you have the company, I'm sure you're a social, like now's the time to promo, give us all the okay. URLs and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, to check us out, go to Conchal Productions, that's C-O-N-C-H-S-H-E-L-L productions.com. And from there, you can go into our Conchal International Film Festival site, which is conchaliff.com. We are at Conchal Prod or at Conchal IFF. But just go to Conchal Prod and, on Instagram. Okay. On Instagram. We're happily there. Check us out, support us, submit your work.
You know, we're here for you if you're the Caribbean or the Caribbean diaspora. Submit By your the way, work. quick question. How old is the Conchal Film Festival? Is this two years? This is okay. our second year. We're very say, young. Is the, like second year or third year. I was not no. really sure, but great. We, we started last year because of this online opportunity that was afforded to us by filmocracy.com because otherwise, you know, fiscally, it would have been improbable or impossible. But because of this burgeoning streaming of film festival industry, it made it possible for us to showcase and highlight the voices of Caribbean and Caribbean diaspora filmmakers. So that's great. Well, it's never really <laughs> impossible. It just takes maybe more energy and more focus, right? More um, years of and building maybe you don't maybe do it as big as you want it the first year. And then, you know, you expand it or whatever. But I, you know, I, I do believe that if you want to do something, it's, it's already there. It's just a matter of like the focus on it, but yeah, I'm it glad that you're able year of to our company. It. Our company is only three years old. So, uh, you know, I that's guess why I say, said I can't wait to see what comes <laughs> next. If it's all this already. Yeah. And it required the support of amazing people and the support of the New York Council of the Arts. And so um, we are eternally grateful. That is just wonderful. Well, I wish you nothing but success and views uh, during this festival and everything else that you're working on and definitely your own festival coming up. Thank you so thank much you. for thank taking you. the time. And thank you guys for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed. Definitely check out Magali's film um, during the Harlem International Film Festival online or in person, but definitely her film online. And you know, we will be bringing you even more um, interviews from this festival, about this festival, in this festival, um, during the next like couple of hours. So thank you so much for watching. I am Lauren Delisa Coleman for the Inside Series here at Filmio.